Thank you. Um, so first of all, I should say that uh, I'm actually on maternity leave. Uh, so this is Eleanor, who is three months old. So hopefully she'll be reasonably quiet for us. But if she's not, then I do apologise in advance. But I think uh, you know, bring, bringing your family to work seems to be the seems to be the new theme of this. So hopefully, hopefully she'll be all right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, da -da 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 -da. so let me just share my screen. Well, so what I wanted to talk to you today about, or what David asked me to talk about, was um, questionnaire-based projects and approaches that can be used um, with uh, undergraduates or masters um, students. Um, um, so uh, that's what I wanted to have a go at. Uh, let me just move that and get into present mode. There we go. So questionnaire-based projects are something that you may or may not have been thinking about uh, in terms of your teaching, but we found them to be quite a useful format of project. Uh, and we've been running them for, for a few years now at Hull. So, um, sorry, sorry. So, we call these, we don't advertise these as questionnaire based projects to our students, we advertise them as science communication projects. Um, so they're presented alongside traditional lab and field based projects in our project book, they're not seen as any different, they're just another option. And I designed them originally because I'm an education focused academic, I don't have my own lab running, so hosting traditional lab projects was something that was going to be too much of a barrier for me to do, but I wanted a way to contribute to our final year project portfolio. So that's kind of where they came from. So uh, we've been doing these questionnaire based projects for a couple of years now, and I think there's some real advantages to doing so. So um, they're very student driven, so you can get students to write questionnaires on almost any topic of interest. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of ones that have been done before. Um, but I certainly as a supervisor of these projects, I've learned about all sorts of weird and wonderful topics that I would never have done had I just been supervising traditional plant biology projects. We found they're pretty inclusive um, projects anyway for those who can't attend lab or field based sessions. So those with care and responsibilities, part time jobs have got to accommodate all of that sort of stuff. A questionnaire based project is actually a very flexible project model. Um, Questionnaire based you know, is providing some basic training in social sciences methodology. So a lot of our students know they're not wanting to go into um, you know, lab based careers. They know that's not for them. They may be wanting to go into teaching or into policy or into general graduate jobs. And being able to develop and analyze a questionnaire, I think is a pretty good skill for general, more, sort of more general employment. And you know, most of our graduates are not gonna go into lab-based jobs. And then we found them pretty sustainable in terms of academic input. I can supervise, you know, I could supervise 20 of these projects in a year you know, quite easily, whereas I wouldn't have been able to supervise 20 undergraduates in, in the traditional lab. So um, we found there's quite a lot of advantages of doing these sorts of projects. So, um, just to give you an example of the sorts of things that some of our students have done, so it's very student-led. We just say, you know, pick a topic and write a questionnaire on it, and when we'll supervise and refine that questionnaire. So some of them we've done in the last couple of years um, are uh, one on the invasive species management, so how do the general public perceive invasive species and their management. We've had public perceptions of shark conservation. We've had, do we all look like Einstein, public perceptions of diversity in science. Um, and then uh, a really nice one from this year, uh, the risks of um, um, thrombosis associated with combined oral contraceptives. So we had a student who was really interested in the pill and how it works and the health risks of it. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to support a lab-based project on that. Nobody in the department works on either the contraceptive pill or on thrombosis. But through one of these questionnaire-based projects, she's been able to do um, a project that really tailors to her interests. And she's actually got Thrombosis UK interested in her, in her data, which is really, really interesting. So I'm hoping that my, uh, we've got a, one of my uh, students on uh, the Zoom call. Um, let me just see if we've got, uh, so is Kira there? 
Kira, are you there? She appears to be on the list there. Oh. No. No. Kira, are you there? Hello. I didn't know how to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fine. So, Kira did this one of these types of projects as, a, as an undergraduate last year. Um, and has continued it on to do it as an MSc by research this year. So uh, I'm going to let Kira just talk about her project for uh, a few minutes and sort of share, share her experiences of doing this type of project and what she thinks she's got out of it. So I'm going to hand over to Kira for a few moments now. So go for it, Kira. Thank you. So I did the Do You Look Like Einstein project because sat in the lecture where we were all picking what we wanted to do with third year there was it was written as like a little example project and it immediately piqued my curiosity because it was something that could be interpreted in a lot of different ways and I've always wanted to be a researcher since I was little I've always wanted to be a scientist it's something I've always enjoyed partaking in in school and outside of school but my degree showed me that lab work just isn't for me it's not something that i can approach with the gusto i feel i should be approaching research with whereas this topic was something that not only can be interpreted in different ways but when i chose to look at it in how do the public perceive diversity in the science science community community it's actually a massive gap in the literature, especially when you start looking at, is it because of rep representation in fictional media, in news media, or in media we use in our schools for education? People aren't looking at it. It's, there's like a handful of papers that I was ever able to find from the last five, 10 years. People aren't looking specifically at the media representation. And I had a lot of fun doing the project in third year, but it felt a lot like I wasn't done, which is why I carried it on to do um, a master's project, because I knew I could get a bigger sample and I could ultimately fill in a gap in, re in the literature, which is what research should be. The full project title was do we all look like einstein and an exploration of the public perception of diversity in science which i broke down into three main questions was who do the public identify as representatives of science what character attributes are associated with scientists and does the demographic of participants influence perceptions of scientists Catherine has very kindly provided two diagrams that you should be able to see that summarize my conclusions a bit nicely. One was that there was a very large white male bias across all the fictional characters that I was given and all the real scientists that I was given in my data set. And that all the attributes I was given were largely very positive, about 70% positive. I did the entire thing by one, one questionnaire. It was designed with overview from Catherine and using academic papers as inspiration. Um, to design a 17 question questionnaire, which was a bit long, but I managed to get 180 or so responses, which was a really, is really good for a, an undergraduate thing, I think. And I did all the data analysis in either Excel or R, but it provided a lot of skills of qualitative analysis, which isn't something you gen tend to get into, into in a biology undergrad. It's all quantitative analysis, whereas actually the qualitative analysis skills are something that I can repurpose into any field I end up in, because you're going to cross, come across survey data in a lot of fields. Um, I also f feel that you get a lot of communication skills out of doing this sort of project. My master's, I'm planning to do supplementary interviews to supplement my questionnaire data, because I'm building upon last year's data to do this project. And, there are, and it's a lot of communication skills on how to conduct an interview, how you want to be unambiguous. It helps you um, do the right emailing. It's a really good introduction to ethics. Like th this year, I took on a lot more of writing the, uh, my own ethics form for my project. But last year, I got to see the forms as they went in and understand what went into them and write my own bits which is really important going forward because most jobs we do involve some form of ethics in science which is really helpful to understand 
Uh, the interviews are going to commence. Renee's just asked, Renee's just asked, how did I undertake my interviews? Um, the interviews are going to happen in the future. I'm, I'm planning to do them via Skype. I'm doing them with academics. And they are going to be done so that before they are recorded, I'm going to establish a field for every person and a pseudonym so that they remain completely anonymous and only audio will be, will be recorded because that way I'm not under GDPR which is a really useful thing to learn about as well which is something I got to understand it's why my survey was done for over 18s which as well was a key factor because a lot of research on scientist perceptions are done in children with draw scientists but other skills as well are presentation skills and professional skills which a lot of undergrads don't have confidence in because the undergraduate world is very different to the professional world and is also very different to the sort of high school world that we've all come from. So it's really nice to have my confidence built up that way. Ultimately as well is that it doesn't have to just be purely the social science project that I've sort of done here. You can do so much with these and it was really cool to chat with my friends when I was doing this as well because it gets the conversation going which I think is more important. That's mostly my notes, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Kira. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so Kira, you know, so yeah, she did it as an undergraduate and we've extended it uh, as an MSc project. Uh, and it's, you know, and it's working really well. We'll hopefully get a quite a nice little paper out of this. So the, the MSc version, we've got a thousand participants in the sort of follow-up version two um, study. So that's great. So. What I thought I'd focus on was some just really practical things about running these types of survey projects, uh, particularly for those who maybe haven't done them before. And it maybe seems a little bit alien when we're used to supervising, you know, PCR and ELISA type project, all of those sorts of things. So um, I think these are the main things to think about in terms of practical considerations for this. I, I kind of came up with four main things, and Kira's mentioned a couple of them. So. Uh, I've got ethics, GDPR, your actual survey platform, and your data analysis. So, um, given that we're, you know, these types of projects are collecting data from human participants, uh, then they do need to be subject to ethical approval and may well uh, fall under GDPR, so the General Data Protection Rules, um, where we need to be very careful in terms of the sorts of data that we collect from people, in terms of Anonymous, um, the data security and whatever. So, um, and you might be sitting there thinking, oh God, if I was going to do 20 uh, students doing one of these projects, that's 20 ethics applications. And like, certainly if your ethics committee is anything like, like ours, our ethics forms are at least 15 pages long and there's another 17 page form for GDPR. Um, it's a pretty intimidating prospect. And I wouldn't want to be doing that for each and every uh, project that I ran. But the way that I've managed to do this is I've submitted, I've, I wrote an over uh, and sort of umbrella application for both ethics and GDPR, which gave me permission to run the student projects for five years. So I sort of gave a remit the types of things that we would be doing. And then each year, um, I share that document with students, I tell them about what's in the ethical approval and kind of what the rules of engagement are. And then I submit an amendment every year of the new survey questions because um, obviously the ethics committee do want to see those, but I submit those as an amendment to the existing ethical approval. So it's like within the framework that we've done this, these are the new questions just to make sure there's nothing controversial in there. And that works really well. So it's relatively minimal in terms of ethics each year. Um, so that was a, that was a big um, change in doing it. Similarly with GDPR, I've got a general data impact prote um, protection assessment on it all. Um, and I am reasonably strict on the rules with students as to the sorts of data that they can collect to make sure that we are classified as a GDPR low risk sort of project. So they're not allowed to collect any email addresses, telephone numbers, IP addresses, any of that sort of stuff. Um, and then they're only allowed to collect demographic data if it directly applies to the hypothesis of their project. So actually Kira did collect some demographic data but most students actually they don't collect any demographics at all um, and that makes it uh, in terms of GDPR if you're not collecting the data in the first place you've then not got protection issues so that would be a recommendation. Um, survey platform, uh, 
all of our institutions subscribe to online surveys.ac.uk these days, I think, and that's a UK-based GDPR compliant tool. Most students will, what will say, can't I use Google Forms for this? Google Forms doesn't sort, store the data on secure enough servers for you to be fully compliant with UK uh, data protection laws. So uh, I would recommend online surveys. It's a bit clunkier than Google Forms, but it's not bad, actually. Uh, I don't know, Kira, have you got any comments on that? Uh, I find that the survey we used is actually really clever and I've enjoyed using it a lot. It was a little bit of a learning curve, whereas with Google Forms, while it's a little more intuitive, it's not got the same sort of freedom to do things, I find. I've been filling in a lot of surveys using Reddit recently, which is a really cool way to push things. Um, and I tend to find that actually the surveys that are done off academic sites work a lot better and feel a lot nicer. Whereas generally the surveys, even the academic ones that I see on Google Forms, don't have quite the same sort of ease to them. So I think it works a lot better to use this sort of thing instead of Google Forms. Yeah, cool. And then the main thing is the uh, data analysis phase. So certainly in our stats curriculum, um, we focus a lot on parametric data, we do a lot of t-tests, ANOVAs, all of that sort of stuff. This generates quite different sorts of data that students haven't necessarily been trained in through the first and second years of their undergraduate, so that needs to be supported a little bit, and I'll talk about that in a second. I find that the most labour-intensive bit is at the beginning of just helping students develop their own questionnaire in the first place, and if you've ever tried to write a questionnaire, you'll know that it's quite a dark art. And it's something that is quite alien to most students who've never had to do this before. So I have some recommendations. I'm going to put together kind of all the resources that I use with my students as a kind of bundle of stuff that you can share. And there's kind of more elaborated guidelines and stuff in there. Um, I found that, uh, so Kira's questionnaire was one of the longest we've run. A 10 question questionnaire is fine in terms of an undergraduate project. You can get really rich data out of it. I think for an undergraduate level project, I'd recommend using closed questions. Uh, students who try to have any sort of open questions of free text or whatever have found it to be a bit of a nightmare uh, in terms of analysis. I think within the scope of an undergraduate project, I'd recommend like at star questions, so strongly agree, disagree type questions or closed questions. Uh, one question format that works quite well if people want an introduction to qualitative is the three words format. So Kira showed you her word cloud before. So she, you know, give three words to describe a scientist. So you're kind of getting a little bit of free text, but it's manageable of just three words rather than sentences and sentences. So that can work quite well. Uh, as I say, not collecting any uh, personal identifiers for GDPR, not collecting demographic data unless you need to. Um, but then I also can't make quite a big point about inclusivity with data collection. So if there are demographics that you're collecting, making sure that you're being inclusive. So for example, including non-binary and prefer not to say options if you're asking about gender, which some participants want to. So that inclusivity, not alienating anyone because of your questionnaire, I think is a really important learning point uh, at that point. Uh, so I tend to find this is the busiest time of the year is the very beginning of the year, writing the questionnaires and getting them all submitted as an ethics amendment. I usually get the ethics amendment in by the beginning of November and my ethics committee kind of expect it and usually turn that around pretty quickly. So October is generally quite busy supervising these sorts of things of helping students get the right questionnaires and getting that ethics in. But then it sort of runs itself for most of the rest of the year. The other thing I mentioned was data analysis. Um, so the way that we organise our projects um, is we put in, for all students, we sort of put in a, um, a data analysis boot camp um, at the beginning of semester two. So a kind of reminder of uh, their stats training, uh, when they've started to collect their own data or whatever. And I've started introducing a session particularly on survey data analysis as part of that uh, boot camp. So we kind of have all the project students together uh, to look at it. Um, the, we use R throughout our teaching, so first years onwards, uh, they're all in R, so by the time they get to the third year, their R's getting pretty good. There's a really nice package in R called Likert, which generates these sorts of graphs. So this is from our student who was interested in the safety of the pill. Um, so this is using the Likert package to get this kind of uh, graduated bar chart kind of a graph, and that's relatively straightforward to do in R with just a little bit of code. And again, I can share those uh, some example data and some code 
with you to show you how you can get those quite nice looking graphs out of the data. So what I do, because it's quite unfamiliar data compared to measuring lengths of stuff and whatever, um, I do provide my students with an example data set for a made up questionnaire, an R script showing how to do that, and an example results section of how to write this style of thing up because it's a little bit different to the sorts of things that they might have written up before. So I give them a kind of dummy questionnaire to base their write-ups on, um, but with that, then it's, you know, it's reasonably sustainable. So uh, you know, if they can get the data into one of these Likert style uh, plots, uh, then, then we're winning. So as I say, it's most of the input is at the beginning with the questionnaire writing and just getting ethics through. Uh, a bit of the data analysis phase, but I found them quite sustainable. I can bulk supervise quite a lot of students on very different topics quite easily, and uh, students seem to really enjoy them. Um, you know, had really nice feedback from some of them. Some, you know, some students got really into it. So this one on the pill, uh, the students proactively contacted Thrombosis UK and has made up some made some professional contacts as a result of her survey. Um, you know, it's, uh, it works really well, particularly for those students who don't want to go, who know they don't want to go into the lab and want a good, high quality alternative. So that's kind of an overview of what we're doing. So if we have questions either in the chat or facilitated, uh, not sure what we want to do, so I'm just looking in the chat. Um, so Alex has asked, did I, have, I previously have experience with survey quality type of research hands off on the learning curve. So uh, when I sort of transitioned to being an education focused academic, I started to write my own surveys and started to sort of look at this in a sort of educational context. So I have got a couple of survey based papers out there. I'd say I was very much self taught. So I dabbled around quite a bit in developing it and there's things I certainly do differently now. Um, but so I have got some experience from my sort of pedagogy education side of what I'm doing but I think in terms of getting started you know 10 like questions agree disagree to what extent do you agree about this I think it's an, it's an easier in point than you might imagine um, and particularly um, you know with a bit of support with data analysis which is so I'm happy to share the resources that I use with my students it's it's reasonably easy to supervise actually so i wouldn't be wouldn't be dissuaded if you haven't done any questionnaire based stuff before but if you have got a colleague who has um or you've got contacts in your local psychology department or whatever like pick brains across disciplines that works quite well uh any other questions dun, 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 dun. Susie. I made a list for you, Catherine, as we're going along. Would you like me to yeah. um, read them out for you? Yes, if you could. Thank you, David. Okay, no problems. Um, so there's one from Adam. It says, what is the minimal time required to undertake a qualitative interview questionnaire project? Ooh, um, it's difficult to kind of conceptualise in terms of time. Our students do it as a 40 credit research project. So they're, you know, they're expected to be the same contribution uh, as a lab-based project. Are we talking about student time or my time? I think that, well, the next question is your time. So in the first instance, student time. And Kira, do you want to comment on that? You can probably comment better than I can. Uh, as my undergraduate project, I don't feel the workload was more than or less than the work expected of the lab students. I think we had a bonus in that um, we could review the data as it was coming in and then it felt like we had longer to work on it in a way simply because the lab data can be done with can be done in one week or one month whereas we have the the month we put these surveys out but then it's a much more steady process um, in the the time taken in it was more relearning how to write up in a different way it's not exactly the same work but it's still an equal amount of work and I don't think it's too difficult at all. I think it's a, a sensible amount of time. Yeah, um, I think well-organized students can have their entire data set collected before Christmas. Um, so certainly the one who was doing the contraceptive pill one, she got a thousand questionnaire responses before Christmas. So she had the whole of semester two to analyze and write up that data. So it, it paces quite well compared to maybe some lab-based projects where it can be quite end-loaded. Um, the 
following on from that, the, the, the question from Volko, I think I hopefully I've said your name correctly, Volko, is that um, from your perspective as the academic supervising these projects, what is, what is your time and effort input into that? Especially you mentioned 20 students, so just, which is quite a lot actually. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, so I haven't done up to 20 students, but I can imagine doing up to 20 students. We had 10, 11 students doing these sorts of projects okay. this year. Um, so as I say, I think it was quite nicely because you can effectively run it as semi group seminars tutorials. So you know, bring your questionnaire to the thing, we'll talk about questionnaire structures and whatever, and then you know, spend one-to-one -one time with those students within that context. So, so in terms of that, you know, what, what makes a good questionnaire or whatever, it sort of becomes a little bit more direct teaching than individual supervision for some of it. Um, so as I say, I tend to run two or three group sessions at the beginning of the year now. Um, to get that questionnaire sorted with one-to-one -one appointments at that point. But then once the questionnaires are live, I basically don't see them until they're at the point of I need to wrangle this to get into the graph. So it's, it's intensive at the beginning of the year, um, but if you set that up well, then the rest of the year is reasonably sustainable. And then you're just writing, you know, you're marking and giving feedback on a dissertation as you would otherwise. So, um, yeah, um, but I think in terms of, um, compared to the amount of contact time you'd require either yourself or a postdoc or a PhD to be supervising techniques in the lab, it's reasonably favourable. Okay. Um, the questions come thick and fast now. Um, I know, I know. So, um, so there's, there's ones about actually, there's quite a few questions about actually getting the questionnaires up and running. So yeah. Nadia asked, do you in, um, offer incentives to participate in the questionnaires? Uh, no, we don't. It's part of the ethics that we don't uh, make getting the ethical approval easier. We talk to students about that. Uh, some students uh, get um, participants quite quickly and easily. Others struggle a little bit more. But no, we don't offer part we don't offer uh, incentives. It wouldn't scale if we did. Yeah. Um... Uh, you did mention in your talk, but do, you teaching the students how to use R is that embedded within the course prior to them starting with you? Yes, so now our students start on R in about week three of their course, so by the time they're in final year, they're reasonably R proficient. Um, you, know, the, you, you can analyse this stuff in other ways, it's just we've made a decision as a department to be R all the way through, which kind of then makes it more helpful at, at this end of it. Okay, fantastic. Um, the next question was, for getting the students into the correct literature for this, because they'll have been used to scientific literature into the background, mm -hmm. how do you, do you direct them with the, the, the appropriate literature for uh, this kind of work? Yeah, so this is, it is a bit more challenging. Um, you know, it's, it's much easier to, you know, search for, I don't know, psych-independent kinases and get a whole load of relevant stuff than it is for this sort of stuff. Um, what we say is for our students, their, so their project write-ups, their introduction should be a roughly equal balance of the original scientific literature on their topics. So if they're doing antimicrobial resistance, then they've got to have the, the relevant canon there. Uh, what I usually do is I've got a sort of folder of you know, four or five papers as a starting point for these sorts of things, which again, I can share those uh, resources. So there's a, you know, here's a starting point. You know, what do we mean by science communication? What do we know about public perceptions of these things? So I do, I do give a little bit more of a hand on you know, finding some of that stuff than I maybe would if I was supervising a purely lab-based project. Uh, but it is, it is more challenging to find the literature. And Kira, do you want to say anything about that? I was going to say, if I may, I've had a, an interesting time of trying to find sources for my particular narrow field of this. And I think it's a skill in itself to be very clever with how you search terms and you've just got to be diligent going through papers. I tend to find, like, if I, if I realise I've got two or three papers from the same sort of journal, I'll try and search that journal's particular site or just that journal in general, because you, you can usually find a nice progression of research that way. But I have to be careful when I do that, because otherwise I can be biased to a certain journal set of research. There are journals out there specifically for science communication as well. The one is literally Journal of Science Communication. That has been very helpful to me. And going into the citations of those papers as well, it's all the same skills you'd use otherwise, but you've kind of got to think outside the box with them to get the right sort of, the right sort of papers because there isn't a sort of a set 
terminology for identifying these papers yet in titles, so they're a bit harder to search for. I've also I'm, in the past done a couple of like peeing people, um, like reports from professional societies, which are quite difficult to find if you don't know they exist. So, so for example, for Kira's, uh, I pinged uh, the Royal Society's report on you know diversity in the STEM pipeline. Um, you know, you know those reports, if you're aware of them, can be really difficult to find if you're unaware of them. So that can be a a thing that will um, uh, will help there. So you know, I do I do give students a bit of a help on that because I think it can be quite overwhelming if I've learned a particular way of searching for literature and it doesn't quite work for some of this stuff as well. Right, um, we've I've got a, there's still a lot of questions for you, Catherine. But what we're going to do is um, thank you very, very kindly for your very informative talk. It's very, very useful. Um, after the next talk, and we've done the questions for that one, we can return and mm -hmm. mop up the last ones if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Or I'll, I'll put a couple of things in the chat as well while we're doing Fantastic. that. Fantastic. I'll um, I'll copy the questions to you so you know what's coming. Um, Nigel, over to you for next. So thank you once again, both Kira and um, Catherine, but very illuminating talks. I've, on the back of what Catherine has taught me in the past, I have started to run these projects as well, um, which I wouldn't have done if she hadn't been able to help me. So her advice is very sound. And uh, Kira, I really want to hear what your master's project is about. So make sure you're at a conference <laughs> when we actually can have them again. <laughs> thank you, that, that's very kind to hear. Brilliant, thank you. Over to you, Nigel. Yeah, thank you just to echo that from David. That was fantastic. It's really nice to hear the student perspective as well. So thank you very much, Kira, for, for jumping in on that. Um, there was a couple of pertinent questions for you to, to help us out with. So uh, there's one from Adam, one from Chris, and one I know the answer to because you told me, but I think the others might want to know the answer as well. Um, so Adam asked, the difference in the time available between a lab project, uh, a, a lab and interview project, and a wet lab project, Mm -hmm. In effect, the wet lab project is time limited and you go in for, say, six weeks and that's it. But the mm -hmm. survey based projects can be extended much into the writing period. How mm -hmm. do you manage that and does that cause any issues? So I, as a department, we've got quite a lot of variation in data collection time scales. We've also got field based projects. So quite a few field based students collect all of their data in the summer before they even start their third year. If they've got something that's sort of seasonally dependent, so there's quite a lot of variation as to when data is actually coming in. As a department, we, we've, you know, we have some, some marker points uh, built into the project module. So particularly there's a poster sort of mini scientific conference thing that happened in March, um, which is designed to be, you should have your data by, you should have something that you can present as either a graph or a gel or whatever it is. Um, at your poster at March to try and kind of corral an expectation that data is in at that point. But as I say, we've got quite a lot of variation. Kira, were you aware of any consternation in terms of time for data collection? Was it an issue from your perspective? You've muted. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, no, my my main issue with data, data collection isn't the time I have to do it in, it's pushing my survey enough to get the amount of data I like. The, the time itself is more than enough time I found in both in both cases as both undergrad and masters. Cool. Um, the other part relates to actually the, the the people you're asking the questions. So so Chris Wilmot was asking, um, do you ever feel that your survey cohort is unbalanced in such that you the surveys go out to you know, friends and family members? And so you have an unrealistic or a, a or a biased pool from which you're drawing from? I almost certainly, and I think particularly for those students who collect a relatively small number of uh, data points, it, it, of course, it's going to be an issue. I'm, I'm not, most of these projects I'm looking at as standalone undergraduate projects. I've not got any intention of publishing most of these surveys because, you know, just in terms of survey reliability and piloting it and the data, you know, data collection or, you know, they wouldn't be robust enough to write a proper paper on most of them. I'm, it's nice working with Kira on hers that we've extended to a master's to get a broader range of people doing it and her undergraduate has effectively been the pilot study for her master's project. So, um, so you, know, it's, you know, it's something that the students are actively encouraged to discuss, you know, in their discussion, I, you know, 
Uh, in my example of how to write it up, uh, you know, the table one that I suggest to all students is a breakdown of those demographics so they can comment on, you know, uh, those if they've collected demographic data. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, it, any d good discussion of whether it's a PCR based project or a survey based project should have a discussion of the limitations of the data, right? And uh, I think it's, but in terms of a learning opportunity, in terms of, you know, skills and stuff to take out to the real world, you know, we need to be so careful about how we interpret questionnaires that go around, you know, for political reasons or whatever. And I think it's a really good thing that, you know, with students are discussing the biases that might be there. So, you know, are they publishable data sets in general? Probably not. Is it a really useful training experience and a good, high quality project in its own right? Yes, would be my answer, I think. Excellent. Um, and a final one, I think it, it would be useful for others to know because I didn't know and you had to tell me. <laughs> was, uh, when, you, when you come to analyze things like the link at data that comes out of these, that you produce at the end and we want yeah. to get meaningful statistics upon them, how, what, what models would you employ? So there's a little bit of a, there are different ways of analyzing like uh, data scales. The way that I um, teach the students, the way that I've written up in my own papers is, you know, convert it from um, strongly agree to being a score of five and strongly disagree to a score of one. So uh, numerical, you know, put uh, numerical values on it. Uh, and then a cross school Wallace test will um, allow you to compare multiple groups within there for statistical significance. Uh, in our cross school wallet, it's a one line command. It's very easily, uh, it's very easily done. For some of the other sorts of questions, uh, you know, if you've got yes, no, maybes or category questions, then you can analyze uh, those as you would any other count type data. Um, so, uh, but yeah, R makes it pretty easy. And as I say, I've got example um, code books and stuff that I can share if people want that. Um, but it's really not, it's really not as intimidating as you, if you can run a t-test in R, you can run across the Wallace. Excellent. And I, I know your, your scripts are actually very, very helpful, Biv, so if you sharing them will be <laughs> most useful for everybody. Brilliant. I think that brings us to the end of the, the outstanding questions for you, Catherine, unless anything pops up in the chat in the next 30 seconds. We, we have actually had a couple of questions that have come in. Really? Okay. Well, I've been, I've, been, I've been busy looking at the screen, not the chat on this instance. So, so now, if you've got those. There was a, a question from, from Joe about what um, the assessment for this looks like, as opposed to just uh, the project write up. So, probably this is for, for both Mona and Catherine. Um, what else are they doing? Are they doing posters, um, three minute theses, Dragon's Den, co creation? Is it, is it just a write up, or is there, are there other assessment components as well that? They have to satisfy. So our model, we so we follow the same model for wet labs or, or dry labs through independent projects. It doesn't matter what your data type was. Uh, the the forty credit module is structured so there's twenty five percent is a project plan and an ethical assessment uh, that's due in, in about November. Uh, there's then twenty five percent is the scientific conference poster presentation, which as I say is in March which there is the expectation that data should have been collected by that point. It might not have been fully analysed, but it should have been collected. And then 50% is on the final write-up, which we do a 4,000 word report rather than a full dissertation format for that. And then this year we introduced um, a couple of formative presentations along the way of just kind of very low key check-ins. This is how it's going. Uh, are there any problems? And that those were, those were there for um, wet lab students as well as SciComm students. So just to kind of check in from the module leader of is everything kind of on track? Are there any issues? Um, but those, that's how the year kind of plans out. 